You better thank your lucky stars, is what my father said to me after I informed him that I had received a Pell Grant to go to theater college. Getting this Pell Grant, he said, was the equivalent of somebody buying me two brand new cars every year for four years straight. Two brand new cars with a new car smell, clean, white, rich, fresh. And that's what theater school was to me. I was the only Asian American kid in my freshman year theater group, and a lot of people would say that I look Caucasian. There were no black people. One of the girls in the grade above me, she was half Puerto Rican, but other than that, for the first time in my life, I was surrounded by white kids who typically came from upper middle class to rich backgrounds. And I know that they did because a lot of them had actual new cars and uh, credit cards with their parents' names on them. And sometimes we would go to the mall together where I would splurge on a pretzel that was cinnamon flavored and they would go shopping at the Banana Republic, which is what upper middle class to rich white people in the Midwest like to wear when they go to fancy outings at places like P.F. Chang's where they can ignite the night. <laughs> the richest kid in my class, a tall, white, semi-handsome guy with big-time lawyer parents, looked like he went to P.F. Chang's a lot. And he could have went to P.F. Chang's a lot because it was commonly known that his parents gave him an additional allowance of $500 a month. It was cool being his friend, this richest kid in my class, because he was also considered to be the best actor in my class. As a freshman, the teacher directors had cast him to play Melanaeus in the main stage production of The Women of Troy. The scenic designer had decided to flood the stage with water. Water on the stage. I had never seen anything like it. I remember him dancing in that water with emotions on his face. The uh, <laughs> stage lights reflecting the sparkly surface where he tapped his feet, and I thought that it was beautiful. But the best actor that I had actually met was still living back in my hometown, getting ready to join the Navy. And his name is Marquise. Marquise was so talented, but he never got a chance at theater college, couldn't even try, because theater college costs money. And a lot of people would say, well, if Marquise was so talented, why didn't he just move to New York and start auditioning or find an abandoned building somewhere and just start making plays out of his car? But it is way more complicated than that. Because when you grow up poor in America, it's hard to break the cycle and your options are limited no matter how talented you are or how hard you truly work. Sometimes it's the luck of the draw that gets you out of certain situations. Besides, it was the armed forces who was at my high school located in the projects almost every single lunch hour recruiting, not theater schools or schools at all for that matter. So of course, Marquise joined the Navy in hopes of a brighter future and the rich kid the one with a $500 allowance was floating, playing a leading part on an expansive flooded stage at a liberal arts school, and I thanked my lucky stars. This is not an uncommon story. And in the professional theater world, it is this precise division, this very unfairness that mirrors the founding of this country, the reason so many voices remain stereotyped or, or appropriated, because oftentimes when we are exposed to these voices, they're being written and depicted by people who really have no idea what it's like to be in that situation, which dangerously can make the art of theater often isolating, exclusive, and inauthentic. I uh, recently interviewed a college theater grad who conveyed to me feeling wary that the theater scene in his college was being perceived as a circle jerk. After uh, various conversations he's had with people outside of his major trying to get them interested in what he was doing, the wariness deriving from the fact that one of the main characteristics of a circle jerk being that it is closed. <laughs> I also interviewed some people on the streets of New York City, the city that we all live and make work in, and many of them seem to echo a similar sentiment, except on a larger scale. Do you like theater? Do you guys like theater? Do you guys like theater arts? You get invited to theater pieces. Rarely. Rarely. Mm -hmm. Now, if you got invited, would you come? Sure. I've never wanted to do a play in my life. When, when I'm just a consumer, I'm going to go with something that's tried and true. Let's be honest, a lot of, of off-Broadway and very cheap theater is sucky.
can get started at seventy dollars. According now, to this newspaper. But but you there's some theaters in this neighborhood that would only charge fifteen dollars. Right. I mean, like so. One way or the other, they have to get the message out. The theater should be a whole lot more fat and a lot less fiction. Yeah. If theater was a whole lot more fat and a lot less fiction, theater would be amazing. I mean, for me in general, the people that usually make it, I mean, it's like percentage-wise, you've got, I would say the biggest percentage are people who come from means and connections. So when you're living in a bubble like theater college, which is how many American institutions find artists of the future, right? When you're living in a bubble like theater college where you're eating together and, and, and loving each other and breathing together, and when I say breathing together, I mean literally there was a class in my curriculum called site-specific theater where we would just breathe <laughs> while rolling on top of each other non-sexually for long periods of time, sometimes in the grass sometimes blindfolded in that grass, sometimes drawing out our feelings with colored pencils in that grass. You don't think about things like class division or race division or the fact that to study theater at that particular liberal arts school and many colleges that offer theater as a major, especially in New York City, it can cost upwards of $19,000 a semester. And for $19,000 a semester, you go to theater college to forget and your life is amazing. Because your life solely consists of making plays without worrying about things like, how do I run out of rehearsal space because one is provided for you? Or who is my audience because the department takes care of that? Or who are my mentors because you have teachers whose salaries you pay who are hired to care about you and your precious art. And while you're in theater school, you think, man, I could die happy if I could make this my life. So that's why a lot of young people start theater companies with their college friends. We want to do this forever, and we think that we can do it forever because we read about people who do it forever, and we want to do it in New York fucking city because everywhere else sucks, and this is where our heroes did it in the 1970s, and we want to do that thing, even though a lot of things have changed since then. When I first moved to Brooklyn and told a theater artist that I looked up to about my dreams of becoming a playwright here, they looked at me blankly and said, oh, do you come from money? <laughs> and I said that I didn't, and they said, oh, well, most people in the New York theater scene, they come from at least a little bit of money. You didn't know that? And despite the red flags of theater college, I had no idea. <laughs> because in the New York theater scene, this is kind of a weird secret. And I found through the years that the more you talk about this, try to make sense with this out loud, the angrier people get, which is surprising and scary because it makes perfect logical sense, right? Theater people go to theater college and theater college is expensive. So as a result, that imbalance creates the situation where a bunch of people with safety nets have the guts to pursue this art form in one of the most expensive expensive cities in the world. And why that's still a commendable risk, they still have things like stocks or bonds or parental support that can take shape in the form of a new iPad for Christmas or on a larger scale, a trust fund or a month's rent or the use of a summer home upstate where they can use for theater retreats where there are bonfires. <laughs> yeah. But if you don't come from at least a little bit of money and you still want to pursue theater, something like this might happen. I was 22, working overnights at the Starbucks on 17th and Broadway, and had just spent the last of the $4,500 that I had made selling the eggs in my uterus so that I could purchase a MacBook so that I could assistant direct a musical about global warming. My collaborator, Chase Voorhees, and I were sharing a tiny room in an apartment in bed filled with nothing but two air mattresses. We're platonic, so it was extra sad when we would see each other cry or my left <laughs> boob would fall out of my tank top <laughs> on accident. Uh, <laughs> and while I was assistant directing that musical about global warming, I met Teddy Nicholas, there he is, a extremely talented homosexual playwright and director who uh, is currently trying to support his single disabled mother on a box office assistant salary. And the three of us, over the next 
five years with Lindsay Mack a little later, an actress who has her bank account seized by student loan debt collectors, decided to constantly put on shows <laughs> without thinking about the consequences. <laughs> and we did so at places like Here Arts Center, the Ontological Hysteric Theater, which is now Incubator Arts Project, the Brick Theater, Ars Nova, Boats, Bars, basically any place that would take us at a subsidized rate or a box office split. And we financed these shows by combining the little resources that we had together and the little money that we probably should have been using to take care of our minds and bodies and doing things like eating, but we didn't because we felt hungrier if we didn't do theater. We were all wounded kids in a way who grew up poor with theater healing us, and we just weren't ready to let that go yet. And over time, we somehow built an audience using our friends, of course, but more importantly for us, the readily and immediate marketing tools that are available online like Facebook, Twitter, meetup.com, and Yelp to reach out to people outside of our circles, and it actually worked. Because we believed in that light inside of us, you know, the light that many people in this room have as, as theater makers that makes us put things on the stage with our own money, even if we lose it in between jobs, during jobs, be that sex work or admin work or moving work or painting work or raising other people's children, because it's worth it to us. This thing amidst getting bitter with age as you realize that the cost the cost of doing this is so high. And Teddy, Chase, Lindsay, and I, we kept going, even as we realized that maybe our collective might fail, maybe as we realized we weren't so great yet at what we were doing, or at least some people and some critics went out of their way to tell us that we weren't great yet, we kept going to achieve this greatness. <laughs> Except one day, our theater company completely fell apart emotionally and financially and it combusted. I remember one thing Lindsay said to me before she uh, quit the company on amicable terms. She said, it shouldn't be this hard. But we both smiled because we knew that it is this hard. I mean, every young theater artist has heard our mentors say, don't do theater unless you love it, OK? Don't do theater unless you love it. If you love something else even a little bit, do that thing. <laughs> because it is ugly out here. Welcome to the real world. And you know it probably is really ugly if even the trust fund kid turned experimental theater artist is complaining about their careers and their future. So I'm not standing here because I have any sort of solution to these systematic errors. I'm standing here because the best that I can do as a next generation theater maker is to tell you that I have failed countlessly. <laughs> I was born into failure, and I chose to pursue a profession that was already kind of failing as a whole. So <laughs> it doesn't make sense for me, logically, to be afraid of this failure or let that fear hinder my ability as an artist to be vulnerable and to speak my mind. No young theater artist should, especially if your voice is underrepresented. This is imperative. So maybe before we take our theater to the streets, we actually talk to people on the streets and listen to them and be grateful when they listen to you. Attempt to spread the joy to collaborators and audiences as diverse as the subways that we ride on and do your best to make it known that this art form at its absolute best can create something so uniquely human that no screen could ever replicate it. This is not the time to tiptoe around each other. Do and say whatever the fuck you want in your art. Do the one thing that television and movies can't without immediate consequence. And don't just do it in a Facebook comment. Because if the uncensored nature of the internet has taught us anything, it's that people crave honesty just as much as they crave emotions, excitement, human connection, something they can't get sitting on a couch at home, something that maybe we can find in a dark room together, the truth, with a sense of play and the urgency of a community that has nothing to lose. Because what we have is a chance within this failure, a chance to be fearless. If a movie or a television show fails, it loses millions of dollars. But if a non-profit experimental theater collective show fails, Egos get bruised, and what's an ego worth? Nothing, so kill it. 
and focus instead on writing, speaking, creating, dancing courageously, or as my friend Nick Mawulko told me on Gchat the other day, unceasingly, understanding that one of the many consequences of not doing so in person and on the stage is greater than the consequence of doing exactly that. It's the risk of never, ever being heard the way we want to in our lifetime. So forget theater that reeks of academia, of whiteness, of lies. That is the death of it, and we have already seen enough. Crash the new car. Crash it and burn it and make it explode. There was an error in the program that's totally my fault. Barbara Eldridge designed the lights, and uh, Julia Mesri, Sarah Pauly, and uh, uh, somebody, uh, uh, Chase, co-directed. Okay, thank you. <laughs>